This episode is sponsored by Linode. Linode is offering listeners of this podcast a $20 credit, which is good for four free months at their lowest plan. Their plans start at one gigabyte of RAM for $5 a month. You can get your servers in any of their 10 data centers, and their high memory plans start at 16 gigabytes. Get a server running in under a minute. They do hourly billing with a monthly cap on all plans and add-on services like backups, node balancers, long view, etc. VMs for full control, running Docker containers, encrypted disks, VPNs, etc. You can run a private Git server. They provide native SSD storage, 200 gigabit network, and Intel E5 processors. They have 24-7 friendly support, even on holidays, and a seven-day money-back guaranteed. So go check them out at linode.com slash freelancer show. Ah, cool. Well, I'm excited to chat with you today uh, on freelancing foibles, uh, some common mistakes we've both made in our freelancing and consulting history shared for the education uh, of the listener. Uh, I'm Kai Davis, and today I'm joined by, and I'll let you introduce yourself, my friend. Hey, everyone. I'm Ruben Lerner. Excellent. Well, let's dive in and talk about common foibles. Uh, is it okay if I start with one? Go, go for it. Go for it. So I always get emails from people on my mailing list asking, how do I raise my rates with existing clients? And my stock answer is, it's really, really hard. Uh, it takes a lot of months. It takes a lot of finagling. It takes a lot of relationship management. And so I want to share a story of the time I raised my rates with absolutely no notice to the client and what, uh, what I learned from it. So going into this scenario, I realized I wasn't being paid in comparison with what the market rate for my services were, what other clients are willing to pay. And so I wanted to adjust that payment. And so my brilliant solution was email my point of contact, let them know my rate was going up by around 75%, effective immediately, starting with the next bill. And uh, I got a response back from my contact letting me know that, hey, if I actually read the contract, there was a 45-day period for any adjustments to rate and a bunch of other details. And so raising rates with no advance notice doesn't really work that well. It leaves the client in an unpleasant, jilted situation where a thing they were paying for suddenly costs more, and it could really sour the client relationship. In my case, we ended up finding a middle ground and continuing to work together. But long term, I definitely think doing a sudden rate increase like that, just not the best situation, not the best idea to uh, promote a healthy client relationship. More often than not, I think that results in the client saying, hey, we're going to find another vendor and the relationship just immediately ending. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, I totally sympathize with, with you doing that because I can imagine myself doing that, uh, you know, a few years ago. At the same time, like I think about it from the other perspective, right? Like, so imagine if my accountant were to call me up and say, good news or not so good news, right? Like we're, we're going to be increasing your rates by 75% starting now. And I would be, well, shall we say upset, furious, whatever. Mm -hmm. And there's so much, especially with something like an account, I don't know how much you had it with your work, but like you've got so much lock in, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the thought of switching to someone else would be really difficult. So mm -hmm. yes. So I, I'm curious then like, let, let, let's turn this into like uh uh, how how do we turn lemons into lemonade? So how do you raise your rates now? What, what, have, you, what have you learned, Kai? <laughs> <laughs> what I learned is more communication always beats no communication or less communication. So when people ask, hey, how should I raise my rates now? I say, step one, raise your rates for all new work that comes through your website or whatever your marketing channels are. Just go ahead and do that, even if it results in you billing in sort of two separate classes. Then once you've raised your rate for new work, Approach your past clients, say, hey, you know what? I love working with you. It's been great. We have an extended relationship. Because of the demand for my services, I've raised my rates. Because we've worked together for an extended period, I don't want this to come as a surprise or a shock to you. So you're grandfathered in at your current rate for the next, and it might be one, three, six months, depending on the relationship. After that point, we'll switch over to the new rates. These are the new rates. This is what it looks like. This is what's included. And so I found that it doesn't result in an immediate uptick in revenue, but it warns the client. It lets them know to anticipate this. It lets them say, oh, you know what? We aren't going to be able to afford to budget for this, so let's spend the next three months wrapping up everything, getting us in a period of transition, figuring out how we could move forward on our side. So I like 
communicating more whenever possible in those types of situations. But even then, when it comes to raising rates with an existing client, somebody who's paying you right now for a service, that's really, really, really hard. Most often I tell people, raise it for new clients, raise it for repeat clients who you are not working with currently. But if it is somebody you are currently working with and are currently billing and it's not a egregious scope creep scenario, most, more likely than not, you aren't going to be successful in raising that rate. So wait for that client to naturally churn out and replace it with somebody who's paying your new higher rate. It might be the longer game, but I think it's more successful in the long run. I 100% agree. And I feel vindicated that you have roughly the same strategy as I do. I also, I mean, over the last year, I've raised my rates and I did exactly yeah. that. I started with all the new business that came in and I raised my rates on them by like, I think it was about 15, 20%. Um, and then literally in the last month, month and a half, I emailed my two biggest clients. And I said, look, you should know you're now my lowest paying clients. And I held off on raising my rates for so, you know, for the last year because I value our relationship and how much work we've done together. And I hope you'll appreciate that. I, I need to bring your rates in line. And especially since they're corporate clients, like large corporations, they were so nice and okay about it. And they said, okay, we totally understand go for it. Right. Mm -hmm. And that was that it, it could, could not have been simpler, but if I had simply gone to them and said, Hey, I want more money. Um, it, it would have been much more unpleasant. And I was still a little nervous about raising rates on that. It was only when I was sure that I had enough work coming in that I felt like, okay, I can approach them. And I really didn't have to be that nervous. Um, besides it had been like a good, I think since I started working with them. So two, three, four years since I'd raised my rates at all. So that's like not, not a, a ridiculous time frame in which to do it either. Completely agreed. And I think your point about waiting until you're in a situation of abundance where you didn't feel worried about, hey, what if they say no? Or what if this doesn't come together? Like that's really the best position to start pursuing more aggressive rate increases because, okay, if the client decides to not continue to work together, I have X other clients and I don't have to worry about not being able to pay the rent. Right. Right. Exactly. No, that's great. How about you, a, a, a foible that you've experienced in your freelancing history? Hmm. Oh, so, so, so many fun stories to tell. So, um, I, like, I think many of us, uh, when I started consulting, you know, I started working on my own and I had sort of some working part time for me. And at a certain point, uh, I got married and we moved to a house and I said, you know what? The time has come now to really expand the business because obviously the only way to expand a business is to hire a bunch of people. Of course. So I went and I did that. Um, and I had like two people working for me and then I increased it. I had, I think at the peak about six people working for me. And I rented an office. I rented a house that I used as an office. And this was in early, mid-1999. And I hired people as um, full-time employees with full salaries and benefits. And benefits uh, in Israel, like in, in much of the civilized world, are much greater. <laughs> than, <laughs> or should I just say in the civilized world? <laughs> Thank you all those uh, listeners who have now hung up and deleted the podcast. In any event, um, so it costs quite a bit more than in the U.S. because you, you, I mean, you have to pay for healthcare. That's like not a benefit you have to worry about from businesses elsewhere. But you do have all sorts of, you know, uh, um, pension and so forth. Anyway, as you can imagine from the date, um, as 2000 sort of rolled around, suddenly calls started drying up. Oh. And, uh, and it wasn't clear what was going on. Like everyone was sort of following the news and everyone saw that, you know, dot coms were doing a little worse. But it was pretty dramatic and it was pretty sudden. And basically within the space of a few months, I laid three people off. I had a secretary and two programmers I laid off. I had another programmer who was working basically as a full-time contractor on site with a client. And the client called me up and said, you have two choices. Either he becomes a full-time employee of ours or we stop working with you. No. Um, <laughs> So, so he went to be a full-time employee of theirs and they gave me a finder's fee as if I were a headhunter. So at least that was nice. Mm -hmm. Um, and my final programmer who was working with me, I then went to the U S on a trip. Uh, and I, I heard from one of my clients in Israel and they said, have you heard what happened to your guy? I said, what do you mean? Heard what happened? They said, you didn't hear he was in a car accident in the hospital. <gasps> I said, no, no one, no one mentioned this to me. Um, and basically I literally never spoke to the guy again. He was fine. Like I, I should say he is not dead. He is very much alive, but after being in the hospital and then being at home and then sending a friend to collect his things from my home office, he never spoke to me, never told me what was going on, but he was while I, while I was in the U S and he was supposed to be taking care of all my clients, totally incommunicado. So oh. we were, uh, we were actually on a cruise to the Caribbean. And at that point there was no, um, internet service on the boat. 
So literally every where we went, I went to an internet cafe and was emailing my clients like mad, telling them, no, I've not forgotten you. No, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just in the Caribbean and my, my program is adult and I'll be back soon and we'll take care of you. Uh, I managed oh. to salvage the situation. So what have we learned, Ruben? Uh, <laughs> Don't try and travel number- back to 1999. <laughs> uh, or if you do short dot coms. Um, <laughs> so, so here's the thing. First of all, um, as I said, many of us are under the illusion that the only way to greater profits is to hire people. And that mm-hmm. is certainly one way to do it. Um, and there's so many things to be said about that, um, that I don't necessarily want to go into it. But one of the things that it turns out I was and still am pretty good at is selling myself and that I'm mediocre at doing is selling other people. Um, and so even when I had all those people working for me and we managed to have projects, we were doing okay. We weren't doing amazingly, but we were doing okay. The fact that there was any sort of shock in the economy and that I was on the hook for people's full-time employment was a massive shock to the company and to Mm -hmm. my personal finances also, because suddenly I couldn't really take a salary because I had to pay all these other people and severance and all sorts of other stuff. And I delayed Mm -hmm. firing them as well. So (laughs) there, there, there are a number of lessons. One is, I've now come to the conclusion, don't hire, or if you hire, do it on an hourly basis or an outsourcing basis. Mm -hmm. And so I have a programmer who works for me now. He is amazing in every possible way. He works on an hourly basis. Um, Why? Not because I'm trying to be cruel or anything, but when I don't have work, I just can't be on the hook for for what he's doing. He's effectively subcontracting just with a full-time agreement or like Mm -hmm. an employee agreement. Um, The other thing is, if and when things get bad, it's painful. It's terrible to fire people. But it's worse than to not fire them and have to pay their salaries and not be able to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, and it really was uh, quite quite traumatic and scarring in many ways. And then I had to get out of the lease agreement because I had leased the office for two years. And I basically mm-hmm. said to them, nah, you really don't want the second year. And they were not thrilled to hear this, to say the least. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, so, so like for the last few years, it's basically been me and my wife and this employee. And here and there, I do some subcontracting. And I must say, it's been easier in many, many, many ways. Not having the stress of paying full-time uh, uh, um, salaries has been a huge weight off my shoulders. And uh, as I often describe, you know, my my dream of having the Learner Consulting Towers uh, glistening in the Israeli sunshine, um, boy, I'm so not interested in doing that nowadays uh, when that was clearly <laughs> on my radar way back when. Mm-hmm. Now, similar for me, uh, uh... I've hired people before, but it was as contractors or larger time period contractors. I haven't hired a full-time employee before, but I have fired people in other jobs and it's not fun. It's it's not something you wake up in the morning and you're like, I'm so excited. I get to fire people. It's some, one of those things you stay up late at night saying, like, crap, I have to go in and fire somebody tomorrow. And I definitely was in that exact same scenario where it was like, I don't want to deal with this. Let me run out the clock. Let me see if it could get better. And the truth is, I was just spending money to avoid the problem. Like had I at an earlier time period said, this isn't working, let's end it, da, da, da. It would have saved me money and it would have saved me stress and anxiety and hassle. Oftentimes, ripping off the Band-Aid quickly is the better solution. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, so what, what, what can I say? Uh, now, as I, as I said, like, and, and the whole issue of also having an office outside of the house um, it was healthy in some ways and nice to like mm-hmm. have a separation to some degree between home and work. But, um, but it's, it's, yeah, then you're paying rent on two places, not, not just one. Mm-hmm. Now that, that to, to rabbit hole into that for a second, that's something I keep going back and forth on. I've had home offices for the last, let me think here, seven or eight years. And it's wonderful. I could wake up and in my pajamas, make some tea, walk to the computer, uh, check the Slack, immediately close Slack. It's nice, but it also creates like this weird dissonance where like it's the weekend and the office is there and the computer's there and I might as well sit down for a minute. And like, I, I haven't ever moved towards having a separate office, but I like the idea of it just to better enforce that division of this is the space where I do my business work. This is the space where I relax at home. Now that I've moved to Las Vegas, mm-hmm. I've gotten better at having that as a rule and saying, hey, you know what? It's the weekend. I'm not going to go into the office right now, but it's something that's always in the back of my mind working from a home office. I mean, I work way too much. And even when I had an office, I was working from home, but less. And there was also some sort of clean break. Nowadays, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of out of the house just about every day anyway, doing training elsewhere. So it's, I use my home office for the days I'm, I'm off, off as mm-hmm. a work, recording and catching up and then it, it, at night. But 
I definitely need to be better about closing the door and saying, but I work. Huh. It's hard. It's, it's, it's hard, hard for it's me. Hard. Um, uh, uh, more stories, more stories, more stories. So one, one from the last couple of years, uh, there was a local client that contacted me, not in my positioning, but they were, ref- I think, referred from a friend or somebody I'd done business with. They needed some help with marketing strategy. And so we got together. We worked on a small project, outlined different options for them, and put together a proposal for what the next steps would be. Essentially, a road mapping session focused on their marketing strategy. And the final prices ended up not being in their budget. And I never really followed up with them after that. Engagement ended on a positive note. They gave me a good testimonial. And then a year and a half or so later, I I saw a news story that they had just launched their new website and they had went with this large local provider. And just from Scuttlebutt, I heard that they spent somewhere in the low five figures on the website. And that's that's a decent chunk of change for a B2C business to drop on a website. And I realized that the foible I committed here, the mistake I committed was I didn't follow up to maintain a conversation or communication with the prospect or the past client. And even though there's no guarantee that it would turn into future work. There's a possibility it could have turned into referrals. There was a possibility it could have turned into uh, an ongoing working relationship once finances had become available. And there's a possibility that when they said, hey, we're going to drop you know, ten dollars or $20,000 on this new website, oh, you know, we've been in touch with Kai for the last few months. Let's see if he has input or if there's a part of this he'd be able to help with. So I think the, the foible I committed there was not following up with past clients to see if they have new needs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely, um, I mean, I guess with training now, I, I, I don't have to do that quite as much cause they tend to be on a regular schedule or call me, but I was mm-hmm. always bad about that. I would sort of contact them and <laughs> six months later, Hey, remember me? And it was all, I, I guess contacting them is important, but also contacting them not sounding pathetic is also important, yeah. which I was sort of bad at doing. Yeah. I, I have a habit of relating freelancing and client generation to dating very often. And I think there's an element of feeling or sounding desperate uh, when you're going on a first date or when you're messaging with somebody, you don't want to come off as like too eager or, oh, I'm very, very excited to go on a date. And similarly with clients or prospects or following up, you don't want to be like, hey, super excited to chat with you again. I got a bill coming up. Do you need any help? It's much better to have an ongoing natural (laughs) conversation. (laughs) <laughs> I like for Hello, that. Dear rent payment. That's that's great. That's great. Which is which is the unfortunate truth of when a lot of follow up happens. Oh shit, that project didn't come together. Let me contact my past clients and see if anybody could fill that hole. But it might be a three or a six or a twelve month cold lead or cold past client at that point. Better to and I use the term value added follow up here. Send over something of interest. Send over a relevant article. Send over something they might enjoy hearing about or reading about. And from there, transition the conversation to what's new in your business? What's going on? How could I help? It feels much more natural. It feels much more valuable. It doesn't feel eh, skeezy, and some people could feel a little skeezed with follow up if it's focused entirely on them. And so I advocate this value-based follow-up methodology. Follow up politely, follow up persistently, keep the conversation going. And if and when they have a need, you're going to be top of mind. Right, right. Uh, that absolutely makes sense. How about you? Um, trying to think. What's, well, okay, so so my, my favorite consulting disaster story is as follows. So I'm about to head out the door. At that point, I had an employee also uh, programming, working for me. And we're about to go out the door to a client to have a meeting to work on a project. Um, And as we're about to go out the door, the phone rings. I guess at the time, we actually had an office phone, not cell phones. So this is dating it a bit. And this guy says, are you Ruben Lerner? Yes. Wow, I'm so glad I reached you. I am desperately in need of help. You know how to run Unix systems, right? Linux systems? I said, yes. I said, oh, can you come right now to my office? I was like, no, I can't. I'm going to a client. Turns out that his office was not too far from this other client. So when we finished at the other client's office, we popped by this guy's place. And he said, thank goodness you're here. You know, I had a system administrator. He you know, ran away, went away, went abroad, whatever it was. I can't remember exactly what it was. And we're having disasters right now on our servers. We need you to help work on them. So basically, um, my employee stayed there till about 11 p.m. Uh, and then went home. I pulled an all-nighter. And, uh, <laughs> and and I should note, did not tell my wife what was going on because I was so ensconced in my work. Not a good idea. And I was underground in a server farm, so she couldn't really reach me. I guess I did have a cell phone at the time. Um, 
Anyway, at like six in the morning, I get back home. I basically saved this guy's business. I saved his servers. I got them back up and running. Over the next two weeks, we got everything back up and running. It was really humming along. Everything was great. Now, at the time, I'd hired someone to be sort of a part-time business manager on an outsourcing basis. They'll you know, go through the books and make sure things are running the right way and talk to clients. She said, hey, we, you know, we haven't gotten paid by these people. Um, so we sent you know, a payment request. They sort of ignored it. We sent another payment request. They ignored it. And, and then um, – so basically, my business manager sent them a fax. Remember those faxes? And said, mm-hmm. you, know, you owe us, blah, blah, blah. So they sent us a fax back. That began more or less with Reuven Lerner is a crook and a fraud. He oh claimed he was going to he claimed he was going to fix our servers, and he made all the problems worse. Our business it was ruined as a result, and we are going to sue you for destruction oh. of our property and um, you know fraud and uh, um, you know negligence and on on and on. Needless to say, as this came out of the fax machine and I read it, I was shaking. And angry and totally confused as to what was going on. And uh, they, they, that was also the time they were about to move to the U.S. It was just before that move to the U.S. for me to work on graduate school. So I actually mm-hmm. went to a lawyer and he said, look, you could pursue this. But we looked into it a little bit more. And it turns out this guy was just a fly-by-night operator. And his previous system administrator had not left the country or anything. He probably had been stiffed also and didn't want to oh. work on it anymore. And this guy probably was just a serial, I don't know, abuser, as it were, of system administrators and programmers mm-hmm. who were trusting. He would get them to come in and fix stuff and then would not pay them and go on to the next victim one at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, so what did I learn from this? First of all, always, or at least almost always, start with a contract. It's very nice to have someone desperate. It's very nice they they need you to come in. Don't let that make you foolish in terms of your business practices. Mm-hmm. And yes, I've been in business for more than 20 years. And yes, almost everything can be done with a handshake. And yes, in the grand scheme of things, this wasn't so much money, but it was time and energy and frustration and anger and so on and so forth. And it all could have been avoided. If I would shown up with a, a, a contract and said, great, I'm happy to help you just sign off on this, that would have changed everything because I'm guessing he would have backed off and not wanted our help. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and even if after pulling that all nighter and helping him out, I hadn't gotten him to do a contract. I should have followed up the next day and said, listen, I know we didn't have a chance. Now's the time to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, So the other thing is there are going to be sleazy slam people you work with. Um, I mean, my, my first accountant said this to me when I started with him and when I started my business, he said, you know, if I had all the money that people owed me over all the years I've been in business, boy, would I be a wealthy man? I don't think I'd put it quite that way with me. But you are going to be scammed by people. It is unfortunately part of the, shall we say, cost of doing business. And mm-hmm. it helps to have a good nose for this sort of thing. Quite frankly, my wife is way better at noticing potential fraud than I am. And I am super naive. Don't take advantage of that listeners and asking me for work, by the way. Um, I'm super naive. And um, it, it takes a little while for me to realize that people are scamming me. Um, but it, it's going to happen. And when mm-hmm. it happens, feel angry, feel upset. And then do what you can to make sure it doesn't happen again, or at least not too often. Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android. And all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. My my uh, foible number three is actually very, very, very similar. I, I was approached by somebody to work on a large project together 
It seemed like a great opportunity. It aligned with like my three year objectives. Like we're talking a big, big project here. And the client refused to sign a contract, said that they just did business with handshakes and that would have to be good enough. And thank gosh, my response. Yeah. 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 And, uh, this is less of a foible and more of, Hey, I finally put those lessons I learned in practice. And I said, you know what? Can't do it. Need a contract. They were not willing to sign off on a contract. And so the deal just never moved forward. And it was very interesting for me to see, like, literally all I was asking for was, okay, let's outline payment terms. Let's outline your responsibilities. Let's outline my responsibilities. Let's both sign this. So in two years, when there's any confusion or if like we separate or you get divorced or I get married and divorced, it's clearly spelled out. This is you. This is me. This is what's happening. None of it. Handshake only. Uh, uh, my lesson learned was when you're presented with somebody who doesn't want to sign a contract, there's probably a really good reason for it. And that really good reason is not a reason you want to be associated with in the least. So dear listener, if you're in a position where somebody, where you have a contract in hand and the other party says, oh, you know, I'm not going to sign it or I'm not really a contracts type person, run. Stop work right now immediately if you're doing work already. Do not move forward until you have something saying, this is what you're doing and this is what you're getting paid and this is how you resolve any disagreements about it. It's, it's it, Contracts are always in my mind one of those things that are absolutely necessary for you to have, rarely come into practice of being used, but when you need to use it, oh my gosh, it's so worth having it in place. Yeah. Wow, oh, you're reminding me now of another uh, another thing where we actually had a contract with a client. You know, I was in Israel, the client was in the U.S. Excuse me, we had a contract, and um, basically he just like wormed his way out. He he said we we did some software for him, and he said this is not at all what we wanted, and it was exactly what he wanted. He just didn't want to pay. And mm-hmm. again, this was just before I went to the U.S. You can imagine it was a fun time in my business life. And we just sort of threw up our hands and said, fine, like international lawsuits are going to be a problem. Um, and I'm not going to hire a lawyer to do all this. It just wasn't enough money to make it worthwhile. Um, and so contracts are definitely important. But there's also, at the end of the day, the enforcement of it. And I've spoken mm-hmm. with people over the years of like, is it worth doing business with people in other countries? And even if it's a totally like fine, enlightened Western democracy with rule of law and everything – it's still the moment that you're outside of your country's borders, it's going to end up costing you a lot in terms of time, energy, finding a foreign lawyer and so forth. Mm. And so, um, yeah, have, have, have a contract, but uh, also think about what happens if it goes wrong? Um, how much do you want to be on the hook for? And I know some people just say, well, I'll get paid weekly. And if I'm paid weekly, then it won't be an issue because the worst is I'll, I'll, I'll lose one week's worth of work. Mm hmm. Or one week's worth, one works, uh, one week's worth of payment, I should say. Uh, oh, that one connects right into my next one. I hate letting clients get ahead of me in terms of billing. And since I switched over to package services and payment upfront, it very, very, very rarely happens. But there's always those exceptions, and it never turns out good. Whenever I realize, like, oh, so they owe me two thousand dollars, and I've done the work already. How do I? How do I get the money from them? What am I supposed to do here? And I've been fortunate enough that. It's only bitten me a few times, but it's never a fun situation to be in when you're when the client gets ahead of you and now you have to play catch up. I very, very much recommend billing ahead. If you're doing weekly billing, okay, great. They need to pay you the weekly fee and then you do a week's worth of work. And if they want another week, they pay for that week. And that way, it sort of flips it around. The client might be worried that, oh, the freelancer is now ahead of me. What if they run? But at least it changes it to a situation where you aren't potentially on the hook for, or not on the hook, aren't potentially losing out on a week's worth of payment. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, By the way, I had a a company, like the way it works in Israel is you send out an invoice and then they pay you and then you send them what's called a tax receipt, which is a Mm -hmm. receipt, but it's like the tax receipt is actually the legally binding thing. The invoice has no legal um, ramifications whatsoever. And so I got a call from one of my clients saying, hey, you haven't sent us a tax receipt. And I was like, well, you know, I'm a one-man operation. I send those out twice a month, maybe sometimes even once a month. And they had a very clever strategy for dealing with people like me. They said, that, that is totally fine. But if you don't get it to us by this coming Tuesday, we will not pay you next month. Ah! Okay, I'll be sending my tax receipt. You got you got it. <laughs> That's incentive for me to, uh, <laughs> for, for me to be better about my paperwork. Um, I believe that's called a checkmate. <laughs> yeah, I was very impressed. Uh, strangely, I sent out my, my invoices that night. 
<laughs> when the money's involved, ah, oh, it moves us. Um, trying to think what else. Um, well, I had, I guess this was like years ago. I had a, a client where I did like, they, they wanted me to set up a simple, I would call it an online community and I used online community software, but it was really just to have like a bunch of people in our organization communicate them and the people associated with them and their nonprofit. Mm-hmm. And I set it up and I thought things were great. Um, and then I didn't hear from them. So I figured, mm-hmm. great, they are happy. And then I can't remember if they called me, emailed me, or I happened to bump into them. But it was very clear that some things were not working. And Mm -hmm. when we finally sat down, the guy basically said, this is the worst piece of software we have ever used or seen. And I was like, well, why didn't you tell me? He said, it is your responsibility to check in with me as the paying customer and find out if I am satisfied. If I say nothing, do not assume that that means I'm happy. Like, oh, okay. Now, that was a very useful lesson for me. And you can be sure that in the years following, when I was doing projects for people, I would check in with them and ask them, mm-hmm. are you happy with the work we've done? And or is there something that needs doing? Both because that's like good good manners and good business. But also, um, that, as, you, as you kept saying, Kai, like better more communication than less. And mm-hmm. in this case, I was literally 100% uncommunicative because I figured – you know, if there's a problem, they'll let me know. It's like my, my, my grandfather used to love telling the, the story about the little boy who never spoke. And finally, at the age of 11 years, he had some yogurt for breakfast and said, "Ugh, this is disgusting. His parents said, oh, my God, he never spoke before. What, what, what happened? He said, well, everything was good until now. <laughs> so, so do not assume that everything is good if your clients are not speaking. Assume that you should still be checking in with them and they they will appreciate it, even if it's to say things are good. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that takeaway. Even if it's just the client saying everything's great, thank you so much. Like, great, it allows you to close that mental loop. And if there is an issue, if there is a bug, if there is something that's gnawing at them, it gives them a space and an opportunity to speak about it. I've been amazed. I had a conversation with somebody recently. I, I can't even remember what the context was, but it was it revolved around asking for a refund on a product, and they told me even though a product had like a ninety day one hundred percent money back guarantee, they just were not the type of person who, even if they were one hundred percent dissatisfied with the product, take advantage of that guarantee, which felt a little weird to me and a little like, mm-hmm. but. I guess there's people out there who just aren't comfortable speaking up and saying, hey, I'm not satisfied with this product or, hey, the output of this isn't what I was expecting. Can we change A and B or can you, you know, we make this work somehow? And if you as a freelancer or consultant take the initiative, reach out a week, three weeks, a month after the project and say, hey, just checking in, you know, we did delivery. How are things going? Is everything okay? Exactly to your point, Ruben, they might say, hey, everything's great and perfect, great. Or they might say, hey, here's five issues we found. Great. At least you've been proactive at reaching out to them. And now they feel it's a space where they could speak up. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I've got Um, one more on my side. Excellent. So this was the first road mapping project I ever, ever, ever sold. And I'm so happy I sold it. And you're about to find out why, listener. Uh, a <laughs> company in Eugene contacted me, wanted to build out a new large website. This was when I was focusing primarily on WordPress development and marketing integrations around WordPress. They wanted to build a new website. They reached out to me. We were talking budget of five figure ish. And I said, okay, great. You know, we want to start off with a road mapping project just so I could understand exactly what you need, what the risks are, what you already have. You could share the information with me. I could answer questions. They were super enthusiastic about it. I quoted them a price of 500 bucks for the road mapping project. They said, great. We scheduled the date. I did a little prep work on my side. Literally one hour before the meeting, as I was packing up my bag to get in my car and drive to their office, I get an email from them. We have no money. We're about to declare bankruptcy. We can't afford the $500. We aren't going to be able to build the new website. And the reason I'm so happy that I approach this as a road mapping project, first and foremost, a small scope initial discovery engagement, is because if I had just sent over a proposal, more than likely I would have said, hey, you know, the first payment's due in X days or in a month at this milestone. And I would have started work. I would have spent tens of hours working on this project and then discovered they had no money to pay me. So by having that road mapping project in place, it gave a really early indicator that they could not afford to work together. And it saved me a lot of time and hassle. Yeah, 
yeah, having clients go out of business, not be able to pay you is a real bummer. I've got one like that right now where it's a small project, but <laughs> uh, I, I was sort of thinking, hmm, I don't think they've paid me. I should really check on this. And then I actually got a call from uh, the person who put me in touch with that company saying, mm-hmm. so you remember how I put you in touch with that company? Um, you don't happen to know anyone who would be interested in buying them, do you? Because they've had some <laughs> financial problems. Uh, I said, no, I really don't. And I mentioned I hadn't been paid by them. He said, oh, you, sh- you should really do that soon. I would suggest that. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so like, again, it's not that much money and it's frustrating and annoying and hopefully they will mm-hmm. pay me, but, um, working for people who go out of business is just a bummer on so many fronts. Um, yeah. and sometimes they, they even feel bad about it. Like often they feel bad about it, but there's not much they can do, especially if they declare bankruptcy, then you're really like up a creek more or less. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now so, again, yeah. I think it, oh, please. No, no, no. Just like, like doing things in small stages. Um, and even if you had done the roadmap, you're like worst case, you would like the roadmap for 500 as opposed to then the huge project and not getting paid for it. So doing it in uh-huh. tiny stages is, is good and useful. Yeah. Now I like small stages and it makes it easier, I think, to get payment in advance to circle back to that lesson learned in that point. Like if at the start of the project, you're like, great, it's $20,000, please pay it right now. Client might have a little bit of cold feet around that for realistic reasons, such as that is a lot of money to hand over to someone. But if you split it into smaller discrete phases, hey, you know, here's the five phases for the project. I require payment in advance. It's 3000 bucks for phase one. Okay. Smaller amount of money. They're going to be more willing to move forward. And once you've demonstrated success and competence, on that first project, it's easier to go into phase two. Okay, great. Phase two is $8,000. Hey, now you have whatever the output and the working relationship of phase one was to demonstrate that you work well together, the client likes working with you, you like working with them, less hesitancy around paying in advance. So I like the concept of splitting it into smaller projects, starting with a roadmap and then rolling into multiple phases just as a way to manage the project and make it smaller, more grokkable, easier to, easier to process and understand. Absolutely. Let's see. One, uh, one, one, one last, I don't know if this is a foible so much, but uh, I mentioned to you uh, before we started recording. So it's very, very common. I'm sure many listeners will, will have had this where a client says to you, well, I really can't pay you so much. Can I give you a percentage uh, of, of the you know, income, the profits, whatever is going to pay you later on? And as a general rule, I say no way, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm not interested in any percentage of your business. There have been a few, a very few number of times where I've either worked for people or almost worked for people, and a percentage of the company was sort of um, mentioned, like, or I've said, in addition to my fees, or I give a slight discount on my fees, and I'll take a percentage of the company in exchange. Every single time, but every single time I took this or I did this, it ended up being worthless. And I mm-hmm. never did it thinking I'd become rich from it. I said, okay, if on the off chance things go well, great. Um, but knowing that almost every time it goes nowhere. Of course, um, I learned this lesson so well that when I had a client, um, uh, have a client still, that uh, offered me at some point, instead of paying me more, like to give me a percentage of the company, I was like, no, 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 that's not of interest to me. And well, what do you know? They got investments from some big name investors. And I'm sure within the next few years, they will be sold for a very large amount of money to someone else. Um, now, yeah, that hurts because it would be worth a lot at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I feel like, well, I've been able to pay my mortgage for the last 20 years uh, uh, thanks to my income. And I'm just not the gambling type. That's what it comes down to. I'm a bit risk averse. And yeah. getting percentages from clients is hugely risky in so many ways because you're basically betting not that the product is good. But the product is good, the management is good, the marketing is good, the market timing is right, that they'll have enough customers, on and on, on, that all those things will be worth so much, they'll be worth more than the fees you would lose. Mm -hmm. And that's basically never been the case, or almost never been the case, except for this one case. So on balance, I did the right thing. But it's still kind of annoying that, hmm, wouldn't wouldn't have been smart for me to notice this a little earlier, how well they were doing and approach them before uh, seeing it slip through my fingers. Yeah. Uh, One reason I always hesitate or move away from revenue share projects is partially the risk aversion. And I I honestly, more so than the risk aversion, it's the fact that to do it correctly requires such an in-depth level of access to their business that I don't want that. They don't want that. And no lawyers want that. Like, so let's say it's X percent of revenue. Well, I'll need to have access to all 
incoming revenue streams and all data around that so I'm able to verify the percentage you're paying me. I'll need access to A, B, and C systems. I'll need to basically have that full look into the financial internals of the company. That's a big ask, but that's also a reasonable ask if somebody says, hey, instead of paying you $10,000, let's give you 10% of the revenue this project generates. Well, that there's a lot of details that need to be shared at that point to really make a revenue share like that effective in practice. And more often than not, you need a lawyer, they need a lawyer, the lawyers are going to need to talk this out, you're going to need to talk it out with them. There's just so many details that need to come together in the right way. And even then, exactly to your point, you're making a bet. The company could suddenly go under in six months and you invested all this due diligence time, got all the access only to discover, well, hey, our marketing didn't work and revenue turns out to be zero. Here's your 10% of zero. That, so, so that happened to me last year. Last year, I basically started working with a company and uh, I, I paid my lawyer a lot to go over the contract with them and the contract included a percentage of the company. And I checked in the company and it looked like it was doing fantastically and everything seemed great. And then halfway through the year, the CEO calls me and says, oh, we're not doing so great after all. We're laying off a whole bunch of people and we're not going to be using your services anymore. Ooh. And right. So there there went my percentage as well as, oh, yeah, they still owe me some money, too. Although we'll, we'll, <laughs> now that we bring it up, folks. Um, so. So, yeah, uh, it's it's a gamble. But look, there are people who have done well. Right. There's the, the yeah. famous the mural painter at Facebook who's now a you know, multimillionaire because they couldn't pay him. But those are the rare stories, right? You can't extrapolate from that to assume this is always going to be the case. And you certainly mm -hmm. shouldn't. Completely agreed. W one, one additional detail I'll share on revenue shares is if, dear listener, somebody approaches you with something like a revenue share or, in this case, a profit share, and you're considering it, I really, really, really encourage you to not do a profit share because somebody once said to me, and this has stuck in my head ever since, hey, if you offer, if you do a profit share, you'll be amazed at how fast I can make the profits from this company go to zero. And it's true. You could just have costs That's everywhere right. and eh, we didn't make any money, but there was a million dollars in revenue. And well, okay, here's your 10% of zero again. I think if you do end up doing a deal like that, A, please have a lawyer. B, make sure you do the due diligence. C, have it off of revenue, not of profit, just because there's so many ways to add those costs in and make that money disappear. Yeah, I, I've heard that every single Hollywood movie loses money mm -hmm. in terms of like like corporate in terms of profits. And clearly, they make money, <laughs> but they find all sorts of things that they can have as expenses. And what do you know? Then they don't they don't profit. And so anyone who has foolishly signed a contract in Hollywood to get a share of the profits gets exactly what you said. That's to mm -hmm. say nothing or close to nothing. Yeah. Now it's amazing the magic you could do with accounting when uh, you put a black hat mind to it. <laughs> Should we move into picks? For you, the listeners of Freelancer Show, Loot Crate is offering an opportunity to save 10% on any new subscription at lootcrate.com. Just enter the promo code bridge10 for 10% savings. Loot Crate is one of my favorite things. Every month I get a box in the mail, costs less than $20. And it comes with all kinds of goodies. I have stuff from just looking at my shelf, Batman, Spider-Man, Ninja Turtles, Back to the Future, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars, and much, much more. So if you're a geek, a gamer, anything like that, and you want cool stuff to put around your office, cool t-shirts, comic books, etc., then definitely check out Loot Crate. To save 10% on your new subscription, go to lootcrate.com slash ruby. Again, that's lootcrate.com slash ruby to save 10% on any new subscription. Enter the promo code BRIDGE10 for 10% savings. Sounds, sounds good to me. Speaking of sound, oh. uh, I've got a pick. Uh, I'm sure our listeners have heard of this, but uh, Apple released a new device, the HomePod. I bought one, and the audio is absolutely, absolutely amazing. I love it. Uh, my biggest complaint with it, honestly, is Siri. I don't think Siri is as strong as Alexa. I haven't used Cortana, so I can't speak to that, but it doesn't seem as strong as Alexa right now. So using the device, there's a few instances where I ask Siri to do something that feels like it should be easy, but Siri just can't process the request. But as a speaker, as an audio listening device, absolutely love the HomePod. Strong pick from me this week. Huh, very interesting. Uh, is it in terms of music? Is it better than uh, the uh, Amazon Amazon product whose name I shouldn't mention for fear of angering our <laughs> listeners? <laughs> uh, I think yeah, I I'd say the audio is better. It it 
I'm in no way an audiophile, and so I don't have the most robust sense of taste when it comes to judging it. But compared to my studio headphones, compared to the speakers I was using, it is a richer sound. It feels like a fuller sound compared to a song I was listening to on another device. Hmm. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so I've got, uh, my, my pick is I recently discovered a podcast that's been going on for about a year now from the New York Times called The Daily. Um, and it's way different than I would have expected. It's like a really finely crafted um, radio show, very sort of NPR-ish. Um, but they focus on one topic. It's not a summary of the day's news, which is exactly what I was, was sure it was. I've been a mm -hmm. loyal New York Times reader for, I don't know, I guess like 40 years now. Um, and um, But like it's, it's, they just take one topic, typically an interview with either a reporter who ta reported on something or the subject of an interview uh, or a, a story. I, turned, I heard a whole story about Tanya Harding right in the wake of the movie and uh, all sorts of other stuff. Uh, I, fascinating, fascinating stuff. I definitely don't listen to it on a regular, ba on a you know daily basis, but once or twice a week, even it really I think is um fun, fun and interesting and enlightening. So uh, the, the daily from the New York Times. I don't know why they don't just call it the Times, but hey, what do you know? <laughs> that would be a perfect name for it. Oh, they're missing out. <laughs> they need to hire you, New York Times listeners or uh, employees. <laughs> if you're listening, please contact me <laughs> right now. <laughs> no, that's a good one. I'll have to add that to my podcasts. All right. Well, I guess we finished for today. Eh? And well, let's wrap up. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for listening. Kai, this was fun. And um, I guess we will have everyone next week on The Freelancer Show. Excellent. Good to speak with you, my friend. Dan, talk to you then. Likewise. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.